Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everybody. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live. Welcome, everybody. Um, whether you're watching this live on YouTube on Wednesday evening, or if you're watching this sometime in the future, uh, it should be a nice wild ride for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Because here on Getting Sketchy, uh, either myself or my good friend and fellow artist and art teacher, Ashley Hurst, tries to create a uh, drawing for you guys inside of 45 minutes. We have a timer and everything, and we try to have a lot of fun, but this is nerve wracking. And of course, in 45 minutes, we're not going to create a complete drawing. We're going to create a sketch. Now, it's going to be a completed sketch, hopefully. At least that's the goal, uh, but it's definitely a looser approach to drawing. And uh, I should say hello to Ashley over there. He's going to be manning the chat box tonight. Ashley, how are you doing over there? I'm doing great, Matt. Thanks for uh, thanks for checking on me over here. Yeah, I've been looking at the chat, seeing who all is joining us and from where you guys are. Um, you guys are all over the world, so thanks for being here with us and, uh, and spending your Wednesday uh, with us. I hope you draw along. Uh, Matt's going to be drawing with graphite tonight, so get your pencils ready. Yeah, and it's so awesome to see all you guys from all over the world. Um, that that makes this so much easier. Um, that's sarcastic, of course. It <laughs> definitely does. It. In fact, I got so nervous uh, when when Ashley said people all over the world that my my finger slipped on the button and there was a flash. Of it's immediate there. discharge <laughs> of hand sweat there. Hang on to your pencil. Well, I have this little sketchbook here in front of the switchboard too, and I've got to put my hand on that. And there's oil pastel on that because I've been cleaning the oil pastel off on it and. Mm -hmm. and Try not to touch it. And anyway, it's a slick no, space. No big deal. Um, there's a shot of Ashley there for you. <laughs> um, so anyway, if you are watching this live, uh, you can of course use the chat box and post questions or comments. Uh, they can be anything that is art related. They don't have to be about what we're doing tonight. And myself or Ashley would do our best to answer those questions for you. Since the chat box gets rolling pretty quick. It uh, is helpful if you put your comments or questions in all capital letters, and that will help Ashley see it a little bit easier tonight. As Ashley mentioned, I'm going to be doing uh, the drawing tonight, and uh, tonight we are going to be drawing an elephant, and we're going to be using graphite, regular old graphite drawing pencil here, and uh, working on white drawing paper. It seems like I haven't used that combination of media for getting sketchy in a really long time. I just completed a, a course called mm -hmm. Realistic Pencil Drawing, where I got uh, a lot of exposure to graphite, but not here on Getting Sketchy. And speaking of courses, um, if you uh, like this kind of stuff, you would definitely enjoy our uh, program that we have over at thevirtualinstructor.com, which includes all of uh, the drawing and painting courses that we create. And of course, that's a broad variety of drawing and painting courses, colored pencils, pen and ink, pastel, uh, portrait drawing. There's a ton to explore over there. Uh, and we also do live lessons. So after tonight's broadcast, we're gonna do an hour long live lesson exclusively for members. And right now, Ashley is doing the series. Uh, we're working with oils to create a still life. Now the live lessons are different from getting sketchy. Uh, getting sketchy, this is quick and loose and we start and finish our sketch in one session. The live lessons, uh, you know, they go on for, for weeks sometimes and it's a complete process yeah, some, yeah, yeah sometimes a while it's a complete process of creating a piece of art from start to finish anyway if you want to uh, check out our membership program which also includes a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers i forgot to mention that there's a link in the description below uh, you can check it out for seven days for free uh, so we have a free trial that everyone starts out with if you want to check out three of our course videos and ebooks for free so you want to kind of dip your toe in the water so to speak there's also a link in the description below this video for that as well. But right now, I think we're ready to get into this. Yeah, we actually have a question already from Sibby Boyd. The question okay. is, can I watch this tomorrow? Uh, I believe you can. Will this be a, this broadcast will be available to rewatch tomorrow, Matt? Yeah, as as soon as it's done here on YouTube, it's going to be available immediately. Um, yeah, so that's great to know. In case you're following along and you just need to see a, a part of Matt's drawing a second time, you'll be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and all of our past episodes are available on YouTube too. Um, and 
I'm trying to get caught up on some of the past episodes. I go back through and I do a write-up, kind of a breakdown of the whole process and the key points uh, for each Getting Sketchy episode. And that's over at on the blog at thevirtualinstructor.com. So um, I think I've got last week's is not posted yet, but the weeks prior to that are. So you can go check that out too if you want a little bit more in-depth or you want to watch one of the, the more recent uh, Getting Sketchy or even some of the old ones. This is season four. Yeah, this that's right. Seven. This is, that's right. This is episode seven. So I guess that means there's uh, 36 hours of of getting sketchy programming. If you haven't already seen it, you can go back and watch all 36 hours. You'll be all caught up. Uh, yeah, maybe 36 hours. I, <laughs> I don't know how many episodes I did back in season one and two, and when I was doing this by myself. So mm-hmm. anyway, um, let's go ahead and get into this. All right, and while Matt sets up, I would welcome welcome everyone from Ohio, Rwanda, Indiana. South Carolina, Croatia, Florida, Arizona, Minnesota, Southwest Illinois, Argentina, Arkansas, Canada, Trinidad, London, and many more. Wow. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. Um, So tonight, as I mentioned, we're going to be working with just regular old graphite pencil. Now, this isn't a regular old graphite pencil. This is a black wing pencil. It's the black wing matte pencil. Um, and I bought these pencils to kind of test them out. And uh, Blackwing makes several different pencils. This one is called the matte pencil, I think, because it's a little bit less shiny than some of the other graphite pencils. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be working with that tonight. I think it's about equivalent to about a 2B pencil. So it's not super dark, but it's also uh, not super light either. It might be a little bit darker than that, maybe a 3B pencil. So I'm going to adjust the amount of pressure that I place on the pencil uh, to hopefully get the full range of value that I need. I have a couple of erasers here. This is an electric eraser. Oh, yeah. Um, and this is just a mono zero eraser. Both of these erasers have a plastic or vinyl eraser inside of it. And, of course, I always have my kneaded eraser handy. Every once in a while, I might come in with a drafting brush and wipe away pencil shavings or something like that. Uh, hopefully, there aren't pencil shavings on the, <laughs> on the drawing <laughs> surface. Uh, maybe eraser marks or, you know, I just I, do, I need this. I need to have the drafting brush beside me. <laughs> Um, I just, just need it. So I've, I have it, and I also have a paper towel. Uh, the brush keeps you from blowing into your microphone, you know, right. blowing, blowing all that dust off. Oh, and, oh. I, just, right. I just rubbed the brush over the microphone. I hope that wasn't <laughs> I hope uh, they didn't hear ridiculously that. Uh, obnoxious. Mm-hmm. Um, I also have a paper towel here. I'm probably going to use this at some point to keep the palm of my hand from touching the paper. I don't know if I'll use it or not, but um, I, I've got it here just in case. The paper I'm working on I believe is 70 pound paper. It's Strathmore drawing paper. It may be 80 pound uh, paper. It's it's, uh, just generic white drawing paper. Of course it's acid free. So it's a step up from newsprint, but it's nothing fancy. It's the same type of paper that you would find in your sketchbook uh, for the most part. Uh, The photo reference over here uh, has been manipulated to a certain degree. I got this from Pixabay. And it was just on a transparent background, so I threw it on a white background and put a little bit of a really makeshift shadow underneath it um, uh, so it somewhat matched the light source. So I did edit it a little bit. I also uh, adjusted the contrast. I actually brought the contrast down so I could see more details Hmm. uh, in the shadowed area uh, on the, um, the elephant. And um, I also brought up some more of the whites and increased the contrast in some of the areas. So I decreased the contrast in the shadows, brought up the contrast in other areas uh, in, that, in the highlighted areas. Now, if you want to know how to, to do all that stuff, uh, we do have a course called Basic Photoshop for Artists. And uh, we cover how to do those kind of things that artists do, or at least I do. I, I use Photoshop all the time. Uh, again, that's part of our membership program. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's see. Our plan of attack here, before I start the timer, is first I'm going to just kind of figure out where I want the the um, elephant to be positioned on the paper. And mm-hmm. I've kind of got an idea of that already. And I'm going to try to make it fit the way that you see it on your screen. So you can kind of make comparisons and I want you to make comparisons and try to find uh, areas that are inaccurate Mm -hmm. because you're going to find them. (laughs) They're going to happen. Um, And, and that's the process of drawing, looking for those inaccuracies. Exactly. That's the process of drawing. And actually by just watching and noticing these things, you are going to be practicing observation and it's the observation skills that are so crucial and important to your success in drawing. Drawing is about observation. You know, mark making is there, 
understanding the materials, all that stuff is important, but observation is key and crucial. So uh, I encourage you to do that. Um, it, anyway, I did put out a hint. Uh, we're doing an elephant, I forgot to mention this, when I sent out the email today, uh, and I mentioned that we are gonna be drawing the world's largest ant, and there you go, it's the elephant. So, <laughs> world's largest ant, I know it's, it's not that funny, but it kind of is funny. <laughs> Uh, I am the king of dad jokes. Uh, That's right. I wasn't going to say dad jokes, but it, since you well, since you did, you have four kids, you know. All right, uh, let's get started here. So I'll start the timer. Oh yeah, you got to bring up the timer. There we go. Forty-five minutes. Let's get started. So right. first thing I'm going to do is kind of figure out where I want the top to be, and then I'm going to kind of draw a very light line down the center. Of the elephant. I'm going to try to line it up here. So I'm going to look at the screen. And just try to get that lined up. All right, now I'm going to kind of figure out how wide I want the elephant to be. And so I'm Matt gonna, is gonna measuring with his pencil. pencil here. Yeah, I'm measuring with my pencil to figure out, according to this pencil, how wide it needs to be. And it needs to be about this wide. So from this point over to about right here. Now these these proportional measurements, height and width, are really important to make in the beginning of a drawing. Um, of course, you can start drawing shapes and then and then double check or check those proportions after you've got some shapes on paper. It could come as a second step, but I like to do what Matt's done myself too, which is kind of check my height and width and make some points to aim at. It's kind of like uh, having a bullseye on a dartboard. You know, you have a, a little spots, little marks or dots to connect. So that measurement I just made was basically ear to ear. Now, what I could do is I could go in and start measuring every little bit, uh, where the top of the head, how wide the top of the head is, and so on. And that's called sighting. A lot of times people call that measuring, and some people call it mapping. So I just refer to it to all of those, uh, all of those designations. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very helpful in capturing accuracy in your drawings, especially in the early stages of the drawing. If we go a little bit wider out here, that's not gonna hurt anybody's feelings. At least I hope not. And I noticed that this ear is a little bit lower than the one over here, so I'm gonna make sure it's a little bit higher up over here. All right, we've got a question from John about graphite pencil sets. John asks, if you could only get one of these two graphite sets, which would you pick? A 9B through an H set or a 6B through a 4H set? Hmm, uh, that's quite a range for either one, I would say. Um, but I would probably pick the 6B through the 4H myself, just because I occasionally like to have a 2H pencil. And what was the other option? 9B through an H. Hmm, okay. Um, I would probably actually prefer the other set. The 9B through the H? Yeah. yeah. Um, and just just because, you know, I'd, I would put up with just having an H pencil instead of a 2H, but I really mm -hmm. don't use anything below a 2H, but I do use a 2H. My thinking was I don't really ever go above a 6B. That's true. I, I wouldn't use the other pencil. I have a 9B pencil also, John. <laughs> And uh, I don't really use it for anything. It's just, I just like having it. It's like, uh, I don't know. It's, it's just, like a drafting brush. Yeah, I get, yeah, it's like a drafting brush, right? It's just neat to own. But it's so dark. It's so dark. And the lead is actually pretty thick in there. It has to be because it's so soft it would break um, easily. And you have to sharpen those pencils all the time. It never ends. Probably, yeah, probably so. Um, all right, so as I'm working down, I'm just kind of looking at areas of contrast here. And I'm also trying to fill out the structure of the head. Now, as I'm, you know, I haven't worked with, I don't do a lot of drawings with this, this pencil, but it is definitely a lot softer than I expected it to be. So we're working down where the eyes are, and the eyes kind of line up with the corners of each one of these ears straight across. So I'm just kind of looking and trying to make a comparison of where that needs to be. Yeah, it's really important to maintain the, the, the subtle tilts. You know, this is an interesting uh, image of an elephant uh, being it's a front view is, is interesting in itself. But the elephant's walking, you know, he's in the middle of his gait. And so all the parts of the body are just a little bit tilted uh, to reflect that motion. So 
So I'm trying to keep my pencil marks light, even though uh, this pencil is wanting to make dark marks. Now, you guys, I don't remember if Matt had mentioned it. He was showing you the plethora of erasers he may or may not use. And uh, the electric eraser, by the way, got a few comments. I used that electric eraser late in my drawing last week, and it really saved me because I had lost some highlights. I was having a hard time getting back because they were so small. I was having a hard time with my handheld eraser. So that electric um, eraser, the one that Matt has particularly, is a fantastic tool. But... The black wing pencil that he's using is an artist pencil. It's got an extra eraser in there, so you may notice it's flat. And as it wears down, you can actually pull extra eraser that is inside of there uh, in, in, in reserve. And so, you know, if, uh, if you struggle drawing with writing pencils because you run out of eraser before you run out of, a gra of graphite, these black wing pencils have addressed that. In fact, it was a student that gave me a, a Blackwing pencil a few years ago. That was the first one that I used and immediately ordered um, two boxes. Okay, so about halfway down the elephant, maybe a little bit over halfway, is where it looks like the tusk begin. So about halfway from the top to the bottom, that's maybe a little bit higher up than halfway, somewhere in here. Mm -hmm. So I need to, I'm just making comparisons again to try to figure out where I need to be in the drawing. And it doesn't have to be perfectly accurate. I'm just, I'm trying, I'm striving for accuracy, but I'm also allowing m myself to not be perfect with it. You know, the end goal here is to, to create a drawing that looks like an elephant, obviously, but it doesn't have to be exactly like this elephant. In fact, it looks like my, my ear feels like it could be a little bit bigger there, but a little bit larger. I think a yeah, lot... Yeah, now that you mention that, the ear on the, on the right, like maybe it's because it's yeah. not in shadow, but it does feel, yeah, it feel, it feel larger feels, than the other ear. feels like I could go a little... It feels like it, it is larger. Mm -hmm. looks like, it looks like this one's maybe a little bit further back. Um, and that could be contributing to that look. So this tusk needs to start about right there. So the head is sort of the most forward part of the of the uh, elephant. The body is totally tucked behind that head. So as long as Matt um, gets the head the way he wants it, he can use it to f sort of fill in the rest of the parts where we can see those legs kind of dropping down from below the ears. I like also in uh, foreshortened imagery to work sort of from front to back. So with different, with different subjects, I kind of work differently. Um, I'm actually spending a lot more time up here on the upper portion than I normally would. Normally, I'd just kind of plan out the entire shape and then go back. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I just feel like this is this is the approach that I want to take. <laughs> well, um, each subject is a little bit different. You know, you don't want to fall into just a formula, the same formula all the time, I guess. No, 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 you're, you're right. We don't want to have the same formula every time, but it does help to kind of have a process um, that is comfortable especially if you're, you're new to drawing. But yeah, I find, my, I find myself trying to f follow the steps that I normally take for every subject, but then sometimes it just doesn't happen that way. Okay, we have a question from Ramon Kamel. Hi, is drawing important to master oil painting? I would say unless you're painting in a, in a non-objective way, like... Um, action painting, think about splatter painting, the action painting that Jackson Pollock did in the 50s. If your goal is to paint in a representational way, imagery that people can, uh, can recognize and understand uh, spatially, then yes, drawing is, is important to oil painting. In fact, um, I had a wonderful professor one time that was uh, answering the same question in, in a class of mine 25 years ago, and he, he, he'd like to say that, that nine-tenths of good painting is just good drawing. And that's pretty close. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, paint can be kind of slick. It can get a little out of control uh, because it doesn't have a, you know, come from a tool with such a, a hard point or tip like a marker or a pen. So there's a little bit of uh, 
of a learning curve in getting used to using a brush over a pencil, but um, measuring proportion and, uh, and drawing shapes accurately, that kind of stuff, um, that's drawing, really, whether it's happening with a pencil or with oil paint. So I would say that mastering or improving your drawing skills along the way is really important to oil painting. Now, having said that, um, the other side of good art is good composition, and that's just how you arrange stuff inside of a rectangle. And you can have mediocre drawing and painting skills and excellent compositions, and you will still be making excellent art. And your drawing skills can improve over time, over the years, but excellent drawing skills don't fix bad composition. So in addition to working on your drawing skills, study composition and principles of balance, our ideas about balance inside of the, uh, in, of the picture plane. And I would just kind of echo what Ashley said. Um, I, I think painting, you know, painting is obviously a different process, but in my opinion, painting is drawing with a wet medium. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are drawing mediums or mediums that we would call drawing mediums that are, you have to have the same thought process as you would if you were painting. For example, soft pastels. It's, it's basically a very similar thought process than if you were painting. Um, but you're obviously applying the media dry. So very similar. And there are a lot of people uh, that want to paint but don't want to draw. And I, I, I kind of understand that, but I also think that maybe... Maybe those folks haven't had a lot of experience painting mm -hmm. <laughs> because um, painting, the, the same concepts are true across painting and drawing. We use the same elements and principles of art. It do doesn't change. You're looking for the same things if you're drawing or if you're painting. You're just applying a different medium. You may be working in, uh, in color versus in grayscale, but that's really the only element of art that you're leaving out is color. You know, um, how we create or how you use texture in a composition or and especially value um, doesn't change values are our most important element of art lightness and darkness and just you know getting values in the right places and in re relatively the correct shapes is what makes these uh, really um, what are distorted shapes on a flat surface look like recognizable 3d shapes to our brains it's all an illusion all an illusion Value makes it happen. Okay, um, Cindy Winter is taking your advice, Matt, and looking for discrepancies in your drawing. And she wonders if the width from ear to ear is a little too narrow. I'm it, not it's, sure, It's though. possible. And I knew that I would be inviting comments sure. by, uh, by asking that. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean find the find the inaccuracies and then, you know, point out that you found the inaccuracies <laughs> because you're going to find them. They're, they're, I, I am not a Xerox. I'm not a copy machine, I should say. And um, that's not what you want. What I want you to see, though, is that it's okay to have some discrepancies yes. in your drawing and your reference. Um, you don't want it to be exactly like your reference. Right. You, you Take want a little pressure like off a, yourself. Right. You want it to be man-made, too. Uh, that's one of the appealing aspects of a drawing or a painting. You know, we do get all that a lot of times when we see images. Now, I'm going to just try to make sure I get this angle. Yeah, of this, this is pretty important. Um, a lot of times we are awed by, by people who create photorealistic drawings or paintings and that's fine. There's a place for that. But um, that doesn't mean that you have to create drawings and paintings that look just like photos. Because honestly, that is a, that is a, um, a display of mastery of the medium and an understanding of value or, and, and a color if it's in color. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a place in the art world for drawings and paintings that are handmade and have a little bit more of a artistic or expressive feel. Yeah, the expressive was the word I was going to use. You know, I love photorealism. It is it is dazzling to see that uh, level of 
of, of media skill. Um, but um, you could make the argument that it's less expressive. Now, here's another discrepancy. You see this little space down here? Mm -hmm. This, I could have brought the trunk down a little bit further or brought the foot up a little bit higher. Um, and I actually think I'm going to bring the foot up a little bit higher. Just a little bit. Yes, um, and kind of piggybacking on what you were talking about, it's important for us as artists to remember that no one ever is going to see our reference except us. And so it's okay not to only have discrepancies um, from the, the reference that happened incidentally in our process, but it's also acceptable to purposefully change what you see um, just because uh, you think it'll make it a better image. And Matt did some of that uh, before... The drawing started, he mentioned that he used Photoshop to manipulate the contrast a little bit in this reference. Even if you don't have Photoshop, you can still manipulate things like value and contrast just by making those decisions in your process, you know, by purposefully drawing or shading a little lighter or a little darker or uh, making a part's proportions a little larger or smaller um, on your own w without the aid of Photoshop just because, uh, because you think it's going to... So in some way contribute or communicate your subject better. Okay, now that I've got the basic contours in place, I'm going to go back and make a few adjustments and a few notes of where we have some value changes, and then I'll start shading, and I'll get as far as I can on the shading here. And let's see, we've got 28 minutes, so I should be able to get pretty far on this. So there's a strong shadow on... The left side here so I'm just mm -hmm. kind of planning out where those darkest values are and I'm actually drawing a shape for that shadow since it's so dominant yeah it's very distinct I love how that tusk on our left just sort of emerges out of that shadow it's almost the reference it's almost hard to tell where it's connected and I'm also going to go ahead and make sure that I've got the details of the eyes in the right place we did have a question that rolled by, and um, some of you have questions that are not in all caps, but I'm trying to see those too. I would I will, would remind you if you're um, new to getting sketchy, um, if you do put your question in all caps, it's more likely to be seen, but I'm trying to see them all as best I can. And a question that I had missed was, what's the best paper to use for inexpensive colored pencils? And I'm not sure... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking from that what would be a good inexpensive paper to use with inexpensive colored pencils possibly because there's such a wide variety of papers that you could use. And the assumption is if you're um, choosing your, for me, if your media is, is on a budget, then maybe your support or what you draw on is on a budget too. So I would say probably a standard 80-pound sulfite, white sulfite drawing paper is good for inexpensive colored pencils. If you go too cheap on your paper, sketch paper, or um, or like printer or computer paper, there's not enough tooth or roughness to the paper. And we're talking about almost like a microscopic tooth, you know, drawing paper compared to computer paper. But you need a little bit of roughness, a little bit of friction on that paper to pull your, um, pull you know, pull the wax off of your colored pencils. And if they're a little bit of a less expensive brand of colored pencils, and they may be a little harder anyway. So you definitely want a paper with some tooth. And I would suggest um, Art Again paper by Strathmore, the gray toned paper. It comes in a sketchbook and it's pretty cheap. Um, and that paper will provide a nice surface for colored pencils. And most importantly, it provides a, a neutral gray surface mm. to work on, which that will make your white colored pencils and lighter colors really stand out and pop. You know, help you create a more full range of value too. All right, and it comes in a sketchbook. It's nice. Oh yeah, yeah, I love that paper. You can buy it as individually, you know, individual large sheets too. Mm -hmm. But all right, so I'm about ready to start here. Really shading. Let's just go down the leg a little bit. Again, just kind of planning out where my darks and lights are going to be. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go ahead and give an indication of where that shadow is, too, that cast shadow. Let's just go down the 
I guess in a, in a sketch like this, you know, a 45-minute sketch, you really have to decide what details are going to be important to you because you could get lost in those wrinkles on that elephant's trunk oh, for days. I can spend, uh, there's a live lesson series that we did with that elephant back there. You see that elephant? I think that elephant is actually <laughs> in the uh, montage that you show at the beginning of getting sketchy. Oh, is it? I okay. think so. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, excellent. Well, that one took, uh, I think, maybe 18 hours. Oh, wow. Something like that. So, yeah. It can and definitely. so that's the difference between getting sketchy and a live lesson, 45 minutes versus maybe 18 hours, similar subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, that whole series... It, it's not 18 hours long. I think it's 10 hours long. But, and there's a, and of course, still, it, is a, it has a complete background and everything, too. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. He's in the forest. And, sure. Uh, it's a much larger drawing. It's on finished paper, you know, that kind of stuff. I'm just going to quickly, I'm not going to try to match wrinkle for wrinkle down, down here and just kind of get an idea. Ooh, I can't lose this shadow. Mm-mm. Yeah, that's the tusk right there. And these wrinkles get closer together. Buddy says that uh, she likes the gray sketchbook for pencil drawing along with white charcoal. Yeah, white yes. charcoal is great. Those gray, gray sketchbooks are great for charcoal. Yeah, that Artigan paper have used for that combination of media quite a bit. It's perfect for that combination of media. David King says, hi, guys. I'm a big fan of you guys, and uh, you are Thank my you. inspiration to be an artist. Awesome. Thanks. That's, that's one, those are fantastic comments. Thank you. Thank you, King David. Brent Does Art says, Matt, do you plan on doing another drawing with Conte this season on Getting Sketchy? Um, no, I actually planned on maybe my last drawing. Yeah, because you just have one more. To actually. be carbon pencil. Oh, that's I, I right. I still want to use the carbon pencil that's again. Right. And I was actually thinking about it this time, but. And we've been getting questions about those types of pencils lately. I have very little experience, so that would be a good one to use. Um, but yeah, I, in future episodes, I'll definitely use uh, the sepia tone mm -hmm. um, pencils again, or, you know, media again. So. Okay, uh, good. For sure. Uh, all right. Uh, I you know, we've got to put the cash out of it. So we're going to put a little in. <laughs> it's, like I'm, it's like I'm scared. Well, our elephant definitely start. looks like he's walking. You know, Matt has done a good job getting the, the foot that's on the ground sort of right, over, right underneath the middle of the elephant so we can really tell that there's weight on that foot. That was important. All right. So I've got a cautious, cautious information here. Now I'm ready to not be so cautious. So I'm going to try to do this quickly. We've got 22 minutes. Um, not too quickly, but quick enough. Um, and I am going to pull in my uh, paper towel here. I'm just going to kind of define these contours a little bit more, make our elephant look a little bit more organic, a little bit more interesting. We've reached about the halfway point of the drawing. Lots of time. Okay, and there's a little bit of shadow down here. I didn't realize we were just on the halfway point. I can, I don't have to rush too much. Brent Desart is excited about the carbon pencils because he likes those just as much as Conte. So okay, great. Excellent. That's good to hear. Okay, I'm going to give this pencil a quick sharpen here, and I'm using a blade, actually, to sharpen it. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I don't need the blade right now. Uh, here, I just need the sanding pad. Uh, yeah, so you I, still have a I lot of lead on there. I take the pencil and rubber this over the sanding pad here to make a sharp point. Yeah, there's still quite a bit of lead that's exposed. And I'm not doing this over the art uh, because... I would draw charcoal and graphite. And all then you could use your drafting brush. Then I, yeah, then I would use my <laughs> racer and my <laughs> drafting brush. All right, let's get to shading. I'm going to start right up here in the corner, and I'm going to try to go quickly, but I'm also going to try to think about the directional strokes that I make when I'm shading. So uh, I kind of want these to flow with the form of the elephant, 
Uh, so as the elephant turns, so do the strokes. And thankfully, this elephant has got some wrinkles there that will help us uh, determine what direction these strokes need to go. Yeah, these wrinkles are like sneaky little contour, uh, cross contour lines sometimes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and sometimes they're not, though. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can get a little tricky. All right. But for the most part. We've got a question. Andrea or Andrea Ellis Grant asks, Matt, would you recommend painting the background first in a painting? It depends on what medium you're using for painting. If you're doing a watercolor painting, no, I would definitely not do that. Um, it, and it depends on the subject, too. I guess you could do that with a watercolor painting, depending on the subject. Uh, yeah, if, you're, if, if your uh, subject is all darker than your background, exactly. then you could get away with that with the watercolor right. painting. But for the most part, with a watercolor painting, you kind of want to work with uh, the watercolor, kind of like what you would do with colored pencils, where uh, you just kind of work in sections. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're using an opaque painting medium, uh, I would suggest possibly starting with the background first. But again, there are exceptions. There is a series that I did where I painted a uh, bird. I think it was a kingfisher bird with acrylics. And I actually painted the bird first. I had a nice neutral background in place, but I painted the bird first. And then I exper experimented, not surprisingly, in Photoshop <laughs> uh, with different background colors before I went in and painted the background. So what I did is I took the painting, um, I took a photograph of the painting and then brought it into Photoshop and tried different colors in the background before I added the color to the background with paint um, because I could have made that decision right from the start, but when you're mixing colors and you're creating a painting, sometimes uh, the colors are not what you think they're gonna be mm -hmm. in your painting. Uh, so if you're just basing it on a photo reference and then you start painting, a lot of times the blues or the, the, that you use are a little bit different or the purples that you mix are a little bit different uh, and so on. So it's sometimes a good idea to make that decision as far as a background color last depending on the subject. Um, but definitely it's medium dependent as well. So I wouldn't say that, yes, you should always do the background first or... or um, no, you shouldn't. I, I would say that there are exceptions to every rule, and there are different circumstances for how you could handle the background. I can give you two examples of, or two reasons you may want to not always paint the background first. In fact, um, I'm a, I paint an oil paint instead of acrylic, which dries really slowly, and so it gives you a little more flexibility. Um, also, if you paint a background in its entirety, with oil paint, it's going to stay wet for a while, so you're going to have a hard time working on top of it um, until that background is dry. But... I often like to paint my foreground subject first and uh, for two reasons, and, and the both reasons are edges. Mm -hmm. Both reasons are edges. So one of them is I can clean up my edges with my background colors, and the backgrounds are usually simpler or less detailed or refined, so I can almost use the background colors like an eraser to refine my contours and my edges. And also, I like to paint the background sometimes along with the foreground, Get it all wet together so that you can soften or blur some of your edges. In that way, um, you control where the eye is looking. So if you want, you could have, for example, you know, um, uh, just say a set of maybe four or five bottles. And you want the bottle that's closest to be sharpest along its edge and the bottle that's furthest away just to be a little softer around the edge, barely out of focus. And if the background and the foreground aren't being painted together, you can't soften that edge. So it really is dependent on the subject and how you want to handle that subject. There's not a there's not one right answer. So I wish there were. Yeah, that was an excellent, excellent uh, point there about the uh, the edges. We're we're going to start a painting at the um in our in the live lesson at Virtual Instructor here in about 45 minutes or so, and um, today we're just going to be working on the underpainting, but next week I plan to start in the foreground and use the background around the still life to manage all of those edges later on in the painting. So I'll be starting a, a painting very soon that, you know, I plan to work on the background last actually. So great question. So as I'm working my way down, I'm, I've shifted now. At first I was thinking about line and shape and relationships of 
uh, where those lines met up and, and those shapes met up. Now I'm thinking in terms of value and the shapes of value that I see. So I've kind of switched my mind to think more like a painter um, at this point in time and just painting with graphite instead of uh, a, a wet painting medium. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of piggyback on what we talked about earlier about uh, should you learn how to, to draw if you're only interested in oil painting, I think that was a similar question. Or, that's right. Or what I just said was similar to what yeah, I was Yeah, that's asked. right. Would uh, drawing help you if you wanted to become an oil painter? Oh, yeah, or, yeah, definitely. Okay, we do have a... A technical question. How does that Blackwing pencil compare to the Faber-Castell 9000 series pencils? Um, I have no earthly idea. Okay. Because I've never used the Faber-Castell. I'm not. I've used a lot of Faber-Castell pencils. I can't remember if 9, they said 9000 on the side. Yeah. So I, I may have used them and I'm not certain. Uh, the, the regular Faber-Castell wooden pencils are really great. Uh, the, the Blackwing pencils just kind of feel, they have a certain feel when you're when you're moving over the surface of the paper, it's almost a smoother yeah, it's very smooth. feel than a regular graphite pencil. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the, the biggest appeals. Not necessarily, it's not totally about the mark that it makes. It's just kind of more about the comfortable feeling you get by using this pencil. Um, okay, so we have an I area agree. of high contrast right here. And in order to preserve it, I'm not gonna put any grays here. I'm just gonna put this dark value right next to it. Mm -hmm. Um, because that part kind of sticks out in light. And we'll just continue working down here. And I am working um, from left to right, top to bottom for the most part, because I'm right-handed. So I'm, if you are left-handed, you might want to work on the other side um, and work your way down. You know, start on the right hand, the right side of the picture plane. This t these tusks have all kinds of junk on them. This, this elephant really is not taking care of their tusk. No, he needs, he needs a tusk brush. Yes. Probably that drafting brush you've got over there would be perfect for an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe a drafting brush with steel bristles. Yeah. That looks like something seriously hard to, to get out. It looks like some serious stains. And this is one of those things that I might choose to leave out because... It's one of those things that looks cool in the photo, but when you include it in the drawing, it could not, it, it's possible it might not translate properly. And those things happen a lot too. Let's see how much time we got, 13 minutes. I'm gonna have to step on the gas here. So try to go a little bit quicker. And I'll just remind everybody, if you're new here, the timer is a suggestion. <laughs> we, we do have a time limit that we do have to adhere to just because we have another broadcast. But um, yeah, when the timer I, goes I off, always go over. no one's head's going to explode mm -hmm. or anything like that. But I can probably pick up the pace here a little bit, draw a little quicker. So hopefully you can get the idea that this is a quicker sketch, but if we were doing a more complete drawing, you know, this process would be a lot slower. The drawing would probably be a lot larger. This is not a very big drawing compared to my hand, especially with graphite, but um, we could definitely put a lot more attention to detail here. I just don't want you to have the idea in your mind that drawing is something that happens really fast. Sometimes it does, most of the time it doesn't. When it does, it looks like it was made fast. I mean, you can tell, yeah. you can see the difference. And there's nothing wrong with that. You should, you should, if you want to improve your drawing skills, um, do what Matt and I are doing. Time, you know, do some time drawings and reduce the time down to five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And the idea is to see how far you can get into a drawing in a limited amount of time. And you'll, your, your brain will start to, um, to, cr to curate what it allows you to work on and what it doesn't. You'll begin to um, learn to focus on the big picture and stay away from the details, at least not too early. Yeah, I remember in art school, we would figure drawing classes. We would start with like a 
three to five minute pose. Mm -hmm. And then we would work our way down into one minute drawings. Oh, y'all would go from longer to shorter. Longer to shorter. We went from shorter to longer. To to start class off. Oh, just to warm up. And then after that, you know, the model would come in and sit there. Well, and that's, you know, that's another reason, I guess, in life drawing classes, why those teachers were... Um, I guess more concerned with our speed and teaching us to work faster because the models are they you know they're they're people too right they have limitations they're, they can only stay still for so long I, you, I know you think it's not hard but it's hard to stay still for twenty minutes at a time so you know we needed to be cognizant of these little pockets of time um, because we had to work inside of twenty minute blocks of time just to um, you know kind of respect the respect the models you know we need breaks. So one thing that's unique about this pencil that, um, you know, I think I mentioned this, but I'll just mention it again. It's called the matte pencil, um, and it is really noticeably less shiny than, than a regular graphite pencil. That's for sure. You can tell a difference. Yeah, it's definitely not, not as shiny. I love that. I, see, my, all my black wing pencils are the black ones. The, you know, the, the paint on the outside is black, not the gray. Well, this is the black one. Oh, okay. But well, then that's what I have. So you have the matte ones. Okay, good. Um, There's been a discussion going on in the chat about those uh, Faber-Castell 9000s versus the black wings and what they compare to. And it seems to be a little discrepancy as to whether or not they're, they're creamy or a little bit scratchy. So I can tell you that the black what, wings... What, the 9000s or the... Or the 9000s. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> not everybody that's... seems to be as happy with them as others, but... I haven't talked to anybody that's used the black wing pencils that are not happy with them. So, and I'm just talking about Matt and I. No, yeah. I'm kidding. More, I've talked to more people than just Matt and myself about the black wing pencils. So, mostly other students are my, my students, but uh, everybody seems to love them. So up here, for there's a te- there's texture on the head, but obviously don't have time to to go in and and do all that texture. So I'm just alternating my marks with kind of a a looser touch. Oh yeah. Uh, to indicate. That there is a texture. Just there. letting little bits of the paper, raw paper, show through. Yeah, I'm using yeah, I'm using the tooth Good. of the paper to give us a feeling you know, when, of some texture. When you showed me this elephant um, before we went live, I thought about that bead paper. Yeah. You know, because of those that really speckly texture in there, that would be a good paper choice for a subject like this too. That possibly. would, but you know, I think with the B paper, I don't think I would ever finish. No, it, it does slow you down. Yeah. You're because you're you're working on using the texture of the paper, you know, and creating a smooth glide. I definitely want over to the surface. try it again. But I haven't had a chance. Um, just gonna move this shattered area up a little bit higher. Now, um, Buddy had a question. Um, when you work on a new, uh, like a subject or motif for the first time, do you like to sketch it in graphite first? Maybe just to sort of practice with it or wrap your mind around it? Um, n- no, but I think that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, that's probably what you should do for every, every drawing or painting that you create, you know, to get a, just a, an idea of uh, the subject. And We're talking about a study, really, doing yeah, a study. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. I don't, I don't do that usually, um, but I think that's a. I should be doing that. It is part of a lot <laughs> of artist process. That's true. If you go back and look at, especially before the advent of photography, it was everybody's process. If you look at the um, sketchbooks of John Singer Sargent, you can find that he sketched little pieces of a lot of his paintings um, in his uh, sketchbooks before he would move on to the brush. And he would do um, painting studies. So, so he would practice the subject um, in a drawing media. Then he would practice it with oil paint. Then he would actually make the painting sometimes. So he did a lot of, a lot of sketches and studies to, um, to really absorb his, uh, his subject sometimes before he created a final piece. Well, the more you do that kind of stuff, the more you're familiar with the subject, the more familiar with it, the more confident you are. Mm-hmm. And it um, translates better, I guess. Yeah, and also the more familiar you are with. I mean, I said that, but I, I'm emphasizing that because mm-hmm. uh, if you're familiar with it, you kind of have an idea of what to expect. 
So yeah, I think that's a good, good suggestion to do that, but I typically don't, just being honest. That side of the tusk a little bit darker, and there's no way I'm going to finish Let's this. Let's see. We've got a couple of questions. The gut shot, uh, 62, says, what do you think of Derwent pencils? You use those sometimes, Matt. Yeah, Derwent pencils are uh, some of my favorites. Yeah, I thought you, I thought you were a fan of those. I, I'm just still getting over the fact that there's a pencil line that has uh, the number 9,000 in it. That, <laughs> it sounds like a product, like a vacuum cleaner or something, you know? <laughs> And um, it sounds like something from. Let me show you how this vacuum suck nine thousand works. <laughs> just tag, give me a moment of your time. It'll draw just about anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounds like, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm I'm trying to desperately work as quickly as I possibly can. Well, you're on the light side of the elephant now. Your uh, invented texture is looking good. Well, I'd actually prefer to be on the shadowed side because then there's no texture. Shade <laughs> things in, you know? Yeah. This, this is a well, nice... you still have, uh, you still have almost five minutes. Oh, that's, that's not plenty of time. <laughs> I tried to say it in a way that made it sound like a lot. You still have almost five minutes. It's all about uh, the tone, I guess. Now, um, right. Patsy has a question. Since you are not blending, is your drawing technique similar to pen and ink um, line drawing? Um, um, not really, because with a pencil, uh, you can adjust the pressure that you place on it to create right. different values. With with pen and ink, you, you can do that to a certain degree, but you're basically just changing the line width. And a, a smaller line looks lighter than a uh, darker line. But with the graphite, you know, I can push harder on the pencil and make a darker line as mm -hmm. I did right there. And that was too dark. I, I was try <laughs> <laughs> trying to show you. And, and uh, anyway, um, so, yeah, it's not, not the same. Um, but you could you could do a pencil drawing. The the like marks are going to remain distinct like they would in an ink drawing, but because Matt can change his pressure, it in it doesn't feel like the same process. Right. You know, in the mind, in the brain. Yeah, and I'm using the texture of the paper here. You can't you can't really do that with pen and ink. Mm -hmm. Two minutes, 52 seconds here. Well, Jen Nabel says that looks, that it's really looking good. Thanks. Well, I got to sharpen this pencil again. So that's All right. Take He's sharpening his pencil. Put the time back on the clock. We need to go back. Oh, no. Put the time back on the clock. I just broke the lead, too. Uh oh. He's had a blowout. Just broke the lead. I'm panicking now for no reason. There's, there's no reason <laughs> for me to panic. Um, I still think we should have very quiet background music that head... speeds up in the last two minutes. <laughs> I still think that would be fun. Not everybody likes explode. background music. Yeah, the problem with the background music, have we talked about this? Some people... Just some people don't like it. Some people hate music. <laughs> no, they just hate our music, probably. There are people that hate music. They're... You know how there's music lovers? Mm -hmm. There are music haters. You know, I tell my own students I hate music just so they won't talk to me about whatever they're listening to at the moment in their in their earbuds. Yeah. I just tell them I hate music. I really I, don't. I love music. No kidding. <laughs> I am I am not kidding. You know, uh, not any of you guys here on the channel right now, of course, but uh, there are some really... <sighs> there's some people out there. <laughs> Let me tell you. And um, I had somebody not too long ago, maybe a month or two ago, write me and tell me that they unsubscribed to my channel because of the music that I had in one video. This is music that has no words and is quietly playing in the background. Not kidding. <laughs> totally unoffensive, pleasant music. 
And it's it's not that that they unsubscribed for playing music. Mm -hmm. It's that they made it a point to tell me that they unsubscribed because of music playing in the background. My goodness. Maybe they thought they were going to give you a, a, a useful tip, you know, that other people would appreciate. No, they just wanted to make somebody else feel bad, <laughs> or that was their attempt. That didn't make me feel bad. I was yeah. just like, well, well you've, if you, you, you're you going to have a rough life. A musicless friend, life. If you haven't already had a rough life. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's just people out there that just want to bring other people down. And uh, they'll do everything they possibly can to do that. All right. 12 seconds. So I'm obviously going to try to finish this. Um, mm -hmm. Just keep going. We really theoretically have Buddy says, about, don't rush, Matt. Even if you don't come to the end, it's an awesome sketch. Oh, well, thanks. But I'm definitely rushing. Yeah, um, we had the suggestion from... Andrea of uh, to use Jaws, the Jaws movie music. That would be good. It speeds up all by itself. I like the idea dun. of the music from dun, World dun, One dun. One on the original Super Mario Brothers. You know, and it speeds up when you get to like a hundred seconds. I well, like that. Well, that's another problem there. If you use the wrong music here, <laughs> you, you get in trouble. Yeah, yeah. Or you, you get sued. You'll lose all audio. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, the video would stay up. There that's just wouldn't okay. be anything to listen to. That's true. So anyway. Um, that's how it is. But, um, yeah, there are music haters out there. So we just don't have any music in the background, which we do enough talking. We don't really. Mm, that's true. We love, we love uh, talking and, and answering, background. reading and answering your questions. So we wouldn't want anybody in this, in this case, in this circumstance, not to not to hear the feedback that they're asking for. Right. So um, there's another question about the black black wing, just to clarify, which one is it you're using again? It's the matte pencil. Okay, the it matte. It has matte on, on the label. It's, it's, and it's not painted the super with a smooth one. It's painted one. with black matte paint. I actually right? wanted to, yeah, there's matte paint on there, yeah, black matte paint. Um, I actually wanted to use the, the super smooth one or whatever it is, the gray one, but mm -hmm. I couldn't find my gray one. So I'm using the black one. And actually I think it's better because it, like I said, it's, it's more of a matte look, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, it's not shiny. It's not as shiny as regular graphite is. So, and since I'm putting a lot of pressure on the pencil, I am definitely flattening the tooth in the areas and it would be really shiny in the areas. But this translates really nicely on screen for you guys. So, Yeah. Uh, all right. So I know the time is up, but I'm going to go ahead and put the finishing touches on here. And that means finishing this leg over here. I know I'm working on the trunk right now, but this leg and body. Um, so we've just got some pronounced wrinkles here. They're not really super dark. Mm -hmm. We do have a question about pastel pencils. Do you have a favorite brand? Uh, yes. My favorite brand are, are Conte Opry pastel uh, pencils, but those are expensive and you will wear through them really quickly. So unless you, um, unless you're really ready to make an investment in pastels and, or pastel pencils, I wouldn't necessarily recommend those. Um, I would probably recommend the Carbothello pencils. Huh. That's what Linda Kay just said. Um, she, she liked the Carbothello pastel okay, great. pencils. So, um, because they are easy to sharpen, they're you know they're kind of a mid-range priced pastel pencil. They're not cheap, but they're not like break the bank expensive either. Mm -hmm. And um, they're a little bit of a harder pastel pencil, which some people might prefer because it's going to give you a little bit more control and the ability to kind of develop details a little bit easier. But the um, Conte Opry are so soft. They're, they're literally like having a traditional soft pastel in a pencil. And that's one of the reasons why they, you wear through them so quickly. But uh, the, the Carbothello pencils and other pastel pencil brands, sometimes it's hard for them to cover pastel applications. And since I typically use... Um, 
pastel pencils with soft pastels. Typically, we'll put down a base of the soft pastels and then you know develop the details with the pastel pencils. That can be um, that can be a drawback to those pencils and uh, the Carbothellos. I mean, the uh, Conte Aperi typically don't have that issue. There are some pigments that are a little bit harder to cover than others. But. Anyway, there's my two cents. All right. Well, great. Hopefully that is, uh, that'll be useful advice. I thought about actually using pastels and pastel pencils tonight with a completely different subject. All right. Well, Ghost Surf has some um, takeaways for us. Uh, new to drawing, I have learned so much from this class. One, you don't have to have a perfect copy of your photograph to have a good drawing. Um, you don't want to rush. You have to take your time. And also, um, make art that is uh, your interpretation. Yeah, that's great. Very good. A+. Plus. <laughs> I think those are excellent observations, and that makes me feel uh, really good that you were able. You said all those things because that is that's a good place that to be. Is, yeah, that's what to I start want people from to understand when you begin a drawing. That's a good place to be. A good mental like frame, you know, a way to f sort of frame your uh, process. Okay, so it's a little bit darker down here. So I'm going to try to create a little bit of a gradation, but I still want that leg to look like it's bent backwards. So there's going to be a little bit more shadow underneath it. I'm just taking all kinds of liberties with the tom. I think we're I think we're still inside of our Inside of our hour, or right there around it. Well, yeah, we're we're pushing it now. So I'm, <laughs> but I think I'm I'm almost ready for the last marks there. Yeah, a little bit darker. There is still a little bit of shine with this pencil, but it is definitely greatly reduced. It, you know, it reminds me a little bit of a, a smaller carbon pencil. Well, that's great because one of the real drawbacks to graphite is its shininess. It can be challenging to photograph and challenging actually to film because of its uh, because of its sheen. It's definitely difficult to photograph, especially under ridiculous lights. Just looking for things that I might have missed here at the end, little areas of contrast I can kind of pop out. Mm-hmm. All right, we'll call that one finished. All right, well, there that looks go. great, Matt. I can uh, he's look like he's uh, walking right out of my screen right now. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, all within 57 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> a 57-minute draw. Um, I well, we, make the you, did more you did a little more talking than that at the beginning. I think it was a little less than 57. Yeah, maybe so. I could make this shadow a little bit darker over here to make it a little bit more dramatic, but... But anyway, um, we'll call that one finished. All right. All right. Well, else? Granny says, always great fun to watch these sketches. Thank you, guys. Motivated Heart says, um, oh, I'm sorry. That was a comment back to another, uh, another listener. Thank you. Laura Patton says, gorgeous drawing. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Great values. Great results, says Rocky Mac. Uh, thank you, Rocky Mac. I love that name. Mm -hmm. Rocky Mac. All right. All uh, right. That's and it. I hope your elephants out there turned out just as well. And if you're still working on yours, just keep going. You don't have a, another show yeah, to do. Yeah, take your time. Take your time. Take your time. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and switch out. All right, thanks for sticking around, all you sketchy students. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed the last uh, 45 minutes. Plus, I definitely did. It was a lot of fun to draw this elephant for you guys. I hope you were able to pick up a few things here and there. Um, I just want to, again, reiterate, if I didn't say this already, when you are creating sketches and practicing, you're using the same artistic muscles that you would use if you were creating a longer, more finished drawing. So uh, don't feel like you gotta pull all of your art materials out and get set up and dive into a really long process in order to improve your drawing skills. Uh, you know, you can just sit down with a sketchbook, find a subject to draw, 
And again, adding that time element in well, gives you a starting point and a finishing point. So it's not overwhelming and uh, you're going to see improvement the more that you do that. Uh, you have anything else to add? Um, Simon says that he just missed the stream, but that's okay, Simon. You can watch it again. It'll be up pretty soon. So I uh, hope you follow along and make a good elephant as well. So um, thank you guys for being here. Next week, it's going to be my turn to draw. I'm going to try to draw. Um, I think I'm going to be working on on black paper. So I'm thinking about white on black paper just to change it up a little bit. I haven't worked with color at all or any uh, tone paper this season. So if you do like following along, then, uh, you know, select black paper and some kind of a white drawing material, white, probably white charcoal for myself. And, and I'll see you then. All right. Well, that sounds exciting for sure. I love using that combination of media and I'll enjoy watching Ashley uh, create a drawing next week. Um, I think that's it. So um, again, if you're new to the channel or if you haven't done so, subscribe, click the notification bell so you're notified when we post new videos. You can check out three of our course videos and eBooks for free. There's a link in the description below. That will also put you on our newsletter list. So uh, we'll send you emails when we post new videos and lessons um, and uh, a bunch of other free stuff that we have for you as well. And uh, the membership program, if you're ready to take your drawing and painting to another level and you want to go a lot deeper, you can check out the membership program over at virtualinstructor.com. Again, there's a link in the description below. There's courses, weekly live lessons, critiques, and a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers. All right, with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and sign out. Good night, everybody.